like a great NFT right now is Red Pill Lions. Anybody who is a holder can join these podcasts. If you wanted a platform, you can come and talk on an already running podcast. We're still here. We have utilities. We flew people out who are holders. It smells like, like really manly, like. Right now, with the literal interpretation of everything on the internet, as like if you say alpha is hard masculine qualities, anything remotely sensitive or remotely emotional, you got a gang of folks in the comments like, well, then he's not the real alpha. He's not the real masculine cat. Mm -hmm. You are bombarded with this kind of shit mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. But there is a concept of a masculine man who is in touch with his feminine side. This mm -hmm. was misconstrued, I believe, a long time back with a call of action to men from women mm -hmm. to be more like women. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, I'm going back way before radical feminism took over, there was always a concept of a masculine man who's in touch with his feminine side, meaning the example I usually use is Tupac. If you didn't actually know why mm -hmm. the whole thing with Jada is she romanticizes Tupac, was alpha witted by Tupac mm -hmm. so much more than like her affection for Will Smith is because Tupac was dangerous, violent, chaotic, mm -hmm. hard. Dark he'd, triad. he'd hop in a shootout, he'd hop in a fight. You could not fuck with Pac, but he was in touch with his feminine side. A poet knew how to mm -hmm. turn on the charm for the ladies, and that is, in a sense, game. Or like how AMS will say, like, mm -hmm. you will attract women with nothing but hard masculine traits, but you have to be somewhat romantic, in a sense, know how to strategize it mm -hmm. to maintain. Mm -hmm. Where did the line get blurred between a masculine man can be in touch with his feminine mm -hmm. side to an extent, and that's part of romance, and romance could be part of game, mm -hmm. with a man's in touch with his feminine side is like purely a bitch. Well, men are the romantics. Women are just the, the receiver, the recipients of romance, okay? Uh, when you look at uh, female romance novels, uh, they're all, all the same. The plot's always the same. It's the same template, the same device. Uh, that romance that is written by women it's usually is like trying to decide between uh, Captain America and, and Iron Man, more or less. And then who's, yeah, and, and they both look like Fabio. So, okay. <laughs> so, um, so you have to remember there's a difference. Like when I talk about romance, well, we think of romance in terms of like old school, uh, the romantic ideal is what I talk about in my fourth book. But uh, what we think of as chivalry, what we think of as romance are two different things. And so when, you, when we talk about, you know, where's a chivalry? Well, chivalry would have been me like not kicking your ass and killing you by knocking you in the back of the head. Like that's, that was pretty much, chival those were the, the code of chivalry. Later on with the romantic ideal with courtly love, then we inserted romance in there and it's like, well, you have to defend Milady's honor, right? And then we think of that and that's really what we think of as chivalry is open the door for Milady. That's never what chivalry was about. So we have to clarify terms first. And uh, the one thing I have like sort of railed against since day one is there is no masculine side and there is no feminine side. That's, Ooh, that is that. Carl Jung, uh, Carl Jung, and that is his theories based on his knowledge and his background from when he, from when 1950, like, or from when he was born up to about 1950, I forget when he died. But he was, he contributed to psychology, no, no doubt. Uh, Sigmund Freud, who we always hate, was his mentor, was his teacher. So when we talk about the anima and the animus, we talk about the male side and the female side and the ma masculine and the feminine, uh, that dovetailed so, so nicely into militant feminism of the late 60s and early 70s because it was used to say, well, uh, it's, it's because the patriarchy, everything is a social construct and the patriarchy has taught you guys not to cry. Like boys don't cry, right? Or, you know, toughen up, Johnny, go on, take a lap, you know, that kind of stuff. And if it, it, what what it was used for was to disqualify and to uh, invalidate masculinity as it is. Okay, I'm not saying that there isn't a masculine and a feminine. I'm just saying why do we why do we cling to this idea that we have a masculine side and a feminine side, and where did that come from? That came from anima and animus, is what it came from for Carl Jung. And then we took a we took that and threw it into pop psychology and threw it into pop culture, and even today in 2022. Uh, we're still talking about this bullshit, okay? So the reason why I say there's no such thing as an, a, a masculine side or a feminine side right now, at least not in the terms that Carl Jung was was proposing at that time, because what happened was we in 1970s feminism, once we had hormonal birth control around 1965 and the rise of putting women into sort of um, 
into the workplace, putting that like the divorce and the divorce rate, by the way, and the hormone use of hormonal birth control. If you look at the stats and you put them next to each other, they rise almost like it. I know Identical. correlation is not causation, but that's a hell of a fucking correlation. OK, so when you look at that, and you look at all the series of events that happened in the wake of inventing the pill. Right. That's when you get you need new psychology, you need new ideology, you need new philosophy to justify what's going on in society. So they jump on top of the oh, if men were would just get in touch with their feminine side, if they would just become more emotional, if they would just like become more feminine or they align with the feminine, identify with the feminine, then they would be more perfect human beings. Mm. They would, you would. In fact, to be a man is to be inhuman. To be a woman is to be human. Mm. And that's the uh, generally how most people perceive. That's how it. most people perceive it. You're you're inhumane. You're, you're it's uh what was it? Uh, that's why the well, women get the kids. Well, when we talk about uh, PUA or talk about game or whatever, they think it's dehumanizing. You know why they say that? Because they think to be human is to be more like a woman. Mm. And so anything that is uh, doing an end run around women's hypergamous filter, anything that that uh, that uh, even the attempt to understand female nature is dehumanizing. The fact that we say, oh, she's a nine or she's a ten. Or, or just referring to the sexual marketplace as a marketplace, that dehumanizes them, right? Well, the reason why it dehumanizes them is because our standard, the correct way to think about humanity is to think of it in terms of being a, being female. We, we would not have wars if, if, if women just like ran the world and they had and we had leadership, which is bullshit, but like that's yeah. the popular concept, yeah. right? And if we could just empower women and make women more than they are, lift them up and dis- uh, crush them, smash the patriarchy, right? Then, Okay, well, what does that look like? That looks like a lot of feminized guys, which is what we have right now. We've been complaining about manginas since really the late 90s, right? Metrosexuals and, and on these guys who are just too, too much of a pussy, and we want them to man up after we've been telling them for decades to man down. The reason why we're doing that is because the social situation had shifted so dramatically during the late 60s and the early 70s that we needed new philosoph- new religions, basically, new ways of thinking about things. And one of those was the idea that we have a masculine and we have a feminine. And the, re- the problem with men today and the reason why they're assholes is because they won't. You know, feminism would work so much better if men would just fucking cooperate, right? Well, it's not in our nature to cooperate with that shit because we think hierarchical and women think more like, you know, communitarian. But... The, so the psychology, the gaslighting, the mass, you know, uh, social engineering had to be based on something. And so men are inherently flawed you, because you don't know anything about your, your internal feminine. And we need the woman to correct us. We need the woman to save us from ourselves. Okay, teach me how to be more feminine. Teach me how to get in touch with my emotions. Teach me how to be more like you. Teach me how to identify. How do I do that? Well, well what you're doing is you're just you're basically feminizing yourself. And, men, and conversely, women have masculinized themselves to the point where I got, I'm talking to women all the time. And the number one problem that women have with me and with, with men today is they go, hey, I got my career, I got my money, I got my business, I got my education on point, I'm ready to go off into the, into the future. And they become the men that they wanted to marry. You've heard me say this before, mm-hmm. but you know where that quote comes from? Where? Not from me, Gloria Steinem. That oh, was wow. from the 70s. She said, some women are becoming, uh, you can go look this up, I'll go look it up on Google. Yeah. Some women are becoming the men they wanted to marry. That is quote unquote glorious. And then who are you going to marry? Exactly. And now here we are in 2022 and they are the daughters and granddaughters of Gloria Steinem. And now they're like, well, where's my man? Where I'm, I'm 36 years old. Where's my guy, Steve Harvey? Where's my guy? Well, you know, my, my mom needs grandkids. Well, how do I? I'm like, well, when they come to me and I say, well, you need to learn to get in touch with your feminine. You need to go learn to be a woman again. You need to, to learn how to submit to a man, or not to submit, but to defer authority to a man. They don't trust men so thoroughly that they, they look at men and they say, I can't trust him. I can't trust him to be, uh, because he's Homer Simpson. He's a bore. He might be abusive. He might be a son of a bitch. He might be incompetent. He doesn't know how to drive a stick shift or change a tire, or do a, t- a necktie or something like that. You can't trust men for your future long-term security. So I have to do it myself. I've got to get my education. I got to be a man. I got to do all these things so that I can cover the beta buck side of hypergamy so that because I can't trust like when when whenever Tori's having to deal with like critics or Allie or anybody else, when when they go and they say uh, when when Allie goes on online and the reason why her TikTok video went viral was because she said, I defer authority to my husband and women just lost their shit because of that. And you know why? Because they're like. Well, what happens if he gets in, he, he he cheats on you and he gets with his secretary? What happens when that happens, mistress? You know, like they're they're you got to have something as a backup. You got to have a side hustle. You got to protect yourself, protect yourself. And they are so fearful of 
of giving over like their life's trust to a man that that's that's their first that's why they freak out and that is a result of women are becoming the men that they wanted to marry because they don't trust men so everything we talked about up to this point right you know men must become women just are the mary sue character everything that we've talked up to this point is really comes back to why why is it that men and women have like such a divide between them because neither one trusts the other now really pretty much men would very much like to but it's not because men are are in less in touch with their emotions or they have a female side it's because they're trying to protect themselves whereas women are trying to protect themselves from men because they're afraid that you know their husband is going to go fuck the secretary or the trophy yeah. bride right later on and they don't want to be it's like 1930s you know dust bowl depression era alimony like and that's not what it's about but we can't get over that because that's been the constant narrative since the invent the invention of the pill so if you look at there's a lot of stuff if i the next book i write will probably be about like sort of the legacy of the pill or the legacy of the sexual revolution um but if you look at all the things that have happened from 1965 all the way up to where we're at right now including Oh, we need to get in touch with our emotional side. We need men need to be vul vulnerability is strength. You would never hear that in a, like a post-war America. You, your your gr my grandfather would never have understood what the fuck that meant. Right. Oh, be vulnerable because chicks need vulnerability. I'll tell you that here's a secret though because I'll, I will get because I have to give you a little bit here, is because I don't know if Lucario touched on this as all as well, but like vulnerability is weakness. Look it up. That's the definition of the word. If we want to talk about like trans women, that's the or, textbook definition. Yeah. If you want to talk about trans women, trans, what is a, like Matt Walsh? What is a woman? Okay. Well, well, well because gonna, they say gonna, to share your weaknesses right, to be vulnerable, right, which is to right. be intimate. And so that, that makes, that makes for a better relationship. I get that. But yeah. the only, the only time that vulnerability is a benefit, a net benefit to a relationship is if your predominant character is alpha. And you are unemotional, or you're un. What's this, you're uh, un, uh, emotionally unavailable, you, because that's who you are. Men and women have different brain sets. Like our, our brains are wired differently. Okay, I've made this point before. It's instinct, emotion, and reason. Okay, for women, they all of us start with instinct first. Okay, so self-preservation. If I threw something at you, you'd flinch. That kind of stuff. Those are that's the instinctual side of like uh, interpreting our surroundings. Fight or flight, right? The adrenaline rush that you get if you see the saber-toothed tiger. Mm -hmm. Instinct. Then there's emotion. Emotion is, is slower than instinct, but it's fast, way faster than rationality and reason. Okay, women lead with emotion. How do I feel about this first? How do I? How do? What is? What is this uh, situation making me feel? And then they might get to re rationality and reason because that takes learning and that's way slower as as an interpretive process, so that you can sort of like contemplate on things and emotion things. is instantaneous. Emotion is, compared to reason, very much so. Yes. In, uh, instantaneous will be instinct, really. Right. And so. And this is, by the way, I'm I'm not pulling this out of my ass. This is called the triune mind theory. I'll I'll explain later. But so, and then for men, it's usually instinct, reason, and then emotion. And you can I can prove this to you with F fMRI studies and show you how men's brains are wired and how women's brains. You've are looked wired. at those as far yes. for book research. Yes, and uh, also the you want to know why women are better at communication. Like why are the why do they uh, oh you see that dirty look that bitch gave me you know that kind of thing and you're yeah. right there and you're like well, what the fuck are you talking about yeah. right or um and 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 I am guilty I apologize for that too that no one time. I was I was just yeah. telling her that when when there's beef with the girls or, or mm. the the female content creators mm. I say that most of the stuff that you guys went at it about it was it was like covert to me it was yeah. like passive aggressive I I, you guys mm, got it instantly mm, whereas since I'm a it. guy I look for someone to put a middle finger in your face so I could go oh yes. that was disrespect. you know why because like, men fight in the physical and women fight in the psychological right and that's right. because our brains are wired for that so when you don't cry at titanic and she's just oh, he's, oh poor jack he's at the bottom of the ocean yeah. <laughs> i'm always like, just thinking that like, must have been cold and you're like I see that. And you're like what the fuck you know why doesn't he get in the lifeboat like either you're like try because that's your reason going well, why are yeah. you not saving your ass right because yeah. oh he's gonna go to the bottom yeah, but, of the but, ocean. Can, but can i ask you real quick so but i was trying to distinguish the difference between i suppose an alpha who's good with women mm -hmm. and partially good with game because he knows mm -hmm. how to manipulate romance should we just not describe that as a man that's in, no, in touch with I'll, his feminine no, here, side? Let me explain. Let me finish the rest of the vulnerability story first. Okay, so if you have a guy who's like, uh, like The Rock, Jason Momoa, like whoever, name the most masculine dude you can think of, who's like sort of like unemotional and kind of like you know got in top top of his game. I don't know who whoever like you. She said uh, Tate. Tate. Okay, whatever. Um, Is that what you said? Yeah. It's yeah, Tate. Tate. Okay. Well, Andrew Tate, Jason Momoa, whoever. Like I you. Did not say you oh, I got headphones. I'm sorry. <laughs> you take. The, Oh you. oh, you. Oh, you. Yes, we yeah. Are. Okay. So I take you, for example. Okay. So if you are emotionally unavailable, if you are more like, you're more stoic, right? 
and it like it's it's the woman taming Tarzan once again, right? It's the alpha male who she like Beauty and the Beast, right? Belle falls in love with the Beast. She can't get in. She can't get under his skin. Um, but then, like through the course of the story, he becomes more vulnerable to her, but only to her because otherwise he's like I mean literally Bell or Lily the Beast has Bell's dad in the dungeon right in the in the in the story right he's like responsible for armies killing other armies right he's basically Vlad the Impaler but she comes into his life and sues the savage beast it's almost like uh, Black Widow and the Hulk right it's it, there the, the narrative is always there you just have to look for it and so the vulnerability of the beast the vulnerability of the guy is the only it's only attractive and it's only um, relationship reaffirming if she thinks she's the only one that can draw it out of the beast if she can mm. only, she's the only one through her feminine wiles through all of the things that she uh, her strengths and her femininity and her female side She's not doing it with ma- her, the masculine. Nobody tells women, hey, get in touch with your masculine side. You know why? Because we we prioritize femininity as some sort of magical, holy, healing uh, element that can make men perfect, right? So the more vulnerable, so drawing that vulnerability out of a guy is like, say, the act of feminizing that guy at that time. So is vulnerability attractive and is it uh, uh, relationship affirming absolutely but only if it's something that is like a rare gift a rare treat it's only for her that makes her feel special I agree with that no yeah. one else can get it except for except for your wife or your like, toy whoever whoever can draw that shit out of you and make that that like the the thing that saves you from yourself kind of thing yeah then so that that vulnerability side is like and it can't be something you wear on your sleeve yeah it, but see that's the problem when guys go, oh, vulnerability is sexy? You said vulnerability is sexy? So I can be vulnerable oh, all the okay, time. Oh, okay, then I'm going to out-vulnerable right. every motherfucker at this table, yes, and I'm yes. going to be the most emo, most uh, most emotionally available guy I can possibly do. But you know why? Because men are men think in terms of hierarchy. I'm in competition with all you guys for this pussy over here. She wants vulnerability? Guys, I'm going to write songs and poems and, and, and you know, bad poetry to be the most vulnerable guy I can possibly be because that's going to get me laid and you guys are just... You guys are just like every other guy, right? That's just whatever can set you apart. So if vulnerability is the metric, the guys are going to be the most vulnerable they possibly can. Mm-hmm. If you take a society that has changed and shifted from hormonal birth control and the and the sexual revolution you take that and then you say guys stop acting like you're masculine stop being so macho you, it, it's fake it's a masquerade it's a mask you wear it's inauthentic you are only masculine because you're being trying to puff yourself up and be like you can never just be the warrior you can never just be the badass right that's why we don't have badass characters in our movies anymore you can't just be that you have to be the badass who you know takes his little niece to fucking soccer practice or mm-hmm. ballet or some shit like that there has to be something that humanizes him something feminine mm-hmm. that humanizes the guy who is otherwise just this beast yeah but i like that better when a masculine man takes care of his daughter or a woman or wolverine mm-hmm. when he had the daughter wolverine yeah. mm-hmm. i like that better than the masculine guy who when he gets home he comes home to the wife who kind of runs the show and he mm-hmm. kind of bows to that like hey that's my queen well, that's why the mandalorian was a big deal because he's pre- that's pre-selection by the way because, for sorry, ladies, but single mommies, you are at an extreme disadvantage. Single fathers, that is a big deal because women look for that and they go, "He's good with kids. That's his kid. Mm-hmm. He fights for his kid. He, the baby Yoda. He's gonna fight for baby mm-hmm. Yoda, right? It's more or, attractive. Yeah, he's got a samurai sword. And he's gonna fight for the kid that's on in the backpack in the pouch behind him. Wow, that's the guy I want to get with because somebody took a chance on him. Some woman took a chance on him. Maybe he's widowed and she's gone now, but he's still parentally invested in his own kid. He's a that's a proven commodity." That's sexy as fuck, especially mm-hmm. for a guy who's like that a woman wants to have a long term relationship with because it's a pr- he's already doing it. He's already invested in his own kid. Why wouldn't he? Well, I wouldn't want to get with that. Right. That's makes sense. But that vulnerability aspect is you know, being parentally invested is not necessarily vulnerability. Mm-hmm. That's just like that's your that's your biological, you know, instinctual imperative. But we, we turn it into because women are the nurturing sex. Right. Women are the ones who take care of the kids. Women don't need a man. They're, they can do everything. They can break, they're just as good a father as they are a mother, right? But when you take a guy who is the single parent of Baby Yoda or whatever, you know, you take that, that stands out as, as something that's very, very attractive. Mm. So, but it's, it's not so much the vulnerability side of things. It's the fact that we want to believe that we 
are, are incomplete or we are, are bad. We're, we're in this constant state of trying to improve ourselves by becoming more feminine. Because th- if we can drop the mask of masculinity and you know smash the patriarchy and align ourselves and identify with the feminine more, then we'd be more perfect and complete human beings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>